Good afternoon, and happy almost 4th of July. My name is Tom Nastic. I'm a public program producer here at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., and it's my pleasure to welcome you today to the William G. McGowan Theater uh, for today's performance and discussion, Frederick Douglass, The Meaning of July 4th for the Negro. And a special welcome to those of you watching on the National Archives YouTube channel, as well as on C-SPAN. Today's program is just one of many programs and events the National Archives will present in Washington and at presidential libraries nationwide in celebration of the 241st anniversary of the adoption of the Declaration of Independence. If you're here in Washington, D.C., this building is the only place to begin your July 4th as we will present our annual Declaration of Independence reading ceremony out on Constitution Avenue. That will begin at 9 a.m. with a live musical performance by Brass Connection. And then our honored guests, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Abigail Adams, and Private Ned Hector will read the Declaration and the names of the signers. Speaking of signers, this year, Laura Murphy, a descendant of signer Philip Livingston of New York, will make remarks. Following the ceremony, there will be a hands-on activities for all ages until 4 p.m. inside the National Archives building, and the museum will may, remain open until 7 p.m. If you're not here in D.C., uh, the reading ceremony, uh, which begins at 10, will be live streamed on the National Archives YouTube channel. Then on Thursday, July 6, we will conclude our celebratory week with a noon program here in this theater, Discovering the Sussex Declaration. Harvard University researchers Danielle Allen and Emily Sneff will discuss the recent identification of a second parchment manuscript of the Declaration of Independence, this one dating to the 1780s. You may have heard or read about this important discovery, so now you can learn the whole story by coming to this theater on Thursday or, again, watching the live stream on the National Archives YouTube channel. To learn more about these and all of our public programs and ex exhibits, consult our monthly calendar of events in print or online at archives.gov. There are copies in the lobby along with a sign-up sheet so you can receive it by regular mail or email. You will also find brochures about other National Archives programs and activities. Another way to get more involved with the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The Foundation supports the work of the agency, especially its education and outreach programs. Pick up your application for membership in the lobby or become a member online at archivesfoundation.org. And now on to our program. It's my pleasure to welcome our three special guests today, actor, writer, and producer Phil Darius Wallace, who will perform for us very shortly, Nathan Johnson, who is supervisory park ranger at the Frederick Douglass National Historic Site here in Washington, D.C., and who will moderate our discussion later. And last but not least, to get us started today, Robert S. Levine, Distinguished University Professor from the University of Maryland College Park. Professor Levine has been an influential force in American and African American literature for over 30 years, and more, more recently has contributed important work to the burgeoning field of hemispheric and transnational American literary studies. He is the author of the 2016 book, The Lives of Frederick Douglass, and following today's program, we'll be signing copies of the book upstairs outside the archive store. Would you please welcome Professor Robert Levine. Thanks for the introduction, Tom, and my thanks to Tom for organizing this event. Um, and it's a real honor to be here. My guess is that you would rather hear an actor over an academic, so I'm gonna be relatively brief with the introduction, about five minutes. So as a lot of you know, Frederick Douglass was born into slavery in 1818 in the eastern shore of Maryland. For the first 20 years of his life, he was a slave moving back and forth between the eastern shore and Baltimore. He escaped from slavery in 1838, taking a train from Baltimore while dressed as a sailor, and he eventually made his way to New Bedford, Massachusetts. He worked in the shipyards there and, and as a minister, staying relatively quiet about his anti-slavery views, in part because he was still a fugitive slave and was afraid of being remanded back into slavery. But in 1841, he spoke out against slavery at an anti-slavery meeting in Nantucket, Massachusetts, and the great abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison was in attendance. Garrison signed him up on the spot as an anti-slavery speaker with a good salary. And Douglas, with the help of Garrison's anti-slavery organization, moved with his wife and two children to a house in Lynn, Massachusetts. 
Over the next several years, he emerged as an electrifying anti-slavery speaker for Garrison's Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. Responding to skepticism that someone as eloquent as Douglas couldn't possibly have been a slave, Douglas, in 1845, published what remains his most famous work, his narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave. This slave narrative or autobiography made Douglas so famous in his own time that he had to flee to Great Britain or otherwise risk being captured as a fugitive slave. While in England, Ireland, and Scotland from 1845 to 1847, Douglas became an international celebrity as an anti-slavery speaker. British supporters bought him out of slavery in 1846, and in 1847, Douglas, now a free man, returned to the United States. But he decided to go to Rochester, New York, instead of back to Massachusetts, because his British supporters had given him money so he could buy a printing press and start up an anti-slavery newspaper, which he called the North Star. He didn't want to stay in Massachusetts and compete directly with Garrison's anti-slavery newspaper, The Liberator, which up to then was the most widely read anti-slavery newspaper. Rochester would remain Douglas's home base for many years until he relocated to Washington, D.C. around 1870. But to return to 1847, Garrison, a white man, was angry at Douglas for starting up a competing black anti-slavery newspaper, and in 1850, the two men publicly broke with each other. This is significant for the 1852 speech that is the focus of the program today. Garrison argued for nonviolence, or what he called moral suasion, and he believed the Constitution was a pro-slavery document. Thus, he argued that anti-slavery people should not become directly involved in the political system. In 1850, Douglas announced his rejection of Garrison's moral suasion position, arguing that slavery was an act of violence against black people, which, on certain occasions, should be met by violence. He also argued that it's important for free blacks to become involved in the political system. Accordingly, in 1850, he also declared his new belief that the Constitution was in spirit an anti-slavery document. In short, in 1850, Douglas emerged as a radical abolitionist. I should add that precipitating Douglas's break with Garrison in the emergence of this new, more aggressive political stance was Congress's passage of the Compromise of 1850, which strengthened the fugitive slave laws that were already on the books. Following the passage of this firmed up fugitive slave law, people in the Northeast, where slavery didn't exist, were nonetheless legally obliged to return fugitive slaves to their masters. From Douglas's point of view, the Compromise of 1850 with its fugitive slave law nationalized slavery and showed the importance of political resistance. For Douglas, the greatest example of political resistance in American history came from the revolutionary fathers and mothers who chose in, 1770, in 1776 to declare their independence from Great Britain and to fight for their independence. That takes us to 1852, the year that Douglas gave what many regard as the greatest anti-slavery speech ever to be delivered in this country, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, an address delivered in Rochester, New York, on July 5th, 1852. Douglas was invited to give this July 4th speech by the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society, and he delivered it at a large hall in Rochester. Between 500 and 600 people, whites and blacks, paid 12 cents each to hear the speech, which back then I think was significant money. An oratory was public entertainment during the, the pre-Civil War years, and people were willing to pay to hear great speakers. Very importantly, Douglas insisted on giving the speech on July 5th and not July 4th. He felt that until all African Americans were free, he could not celebrate July 4th on the 4th. For those of you who think that this country still has a ways to go to achieve all of the ideals of the Declaration of Independence, which of course begins with the assertion that all men are created equal 
It's therefore significant, and in the great Douglas tradition, that we're, that we're having this event on July 3rd and not July 4th. Just before Douglas gave his July 5th speech, Rochester's Reverend Robert R. Raymond read the complete text of the Declaration of Independence. Then Frederick Douglass walked to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, the meaning of July 4th for the Negro, otherwise known as what to the slave, is the 4th of July. Friends and fellow citizens, he who could address this audience without a quailing sensation has stronger nerves than I have. I do not ever remember to have appeared before anyone more shrinkingly, nor with greater distrust of my abilities than I do this day. The fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, the distance between the platform and the slave plantation from which I escaped is considerable. And the difficulties in getting from the latter to the former are by no means slight. That I am here today, to me, is a matter of astonishment as well as of gratitude. With little experience, and less learning, I've managed to place my thoughts hastily and imperfectly together, entrusting to your patient and generous indulgence, I shall proceed to lay them before you. This, for the purpose of this celebration, is the 4th of July. It is the birthday of your national independence. It is to you what the Passover was to the emancipated people of God. It carries your minds back to that day and to the act of your great deliverance. May the patriot not hope that high lessons of wisdom, of justice, and of truth shall yet guide her in her destiny. Were America older, the patriot's heart might be sadder, the reformer's brow heavier. America's future might be shrouded in gloom, and the hope of her prophets go out in sorrow. There is consolation in the thought that America is young. <laughs> Fellow citizens, Pardon me, and allow me to ask, why am I called upon here to speak to you today? What have I, or anyone I represent, to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and natural justice embodied in that declaration of independence extended to us? Am I to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude resulting from the blessing of independence to us. Would to God, for both your sakes and ours, an affirmative answer would truthfully be returned to the question, then would my labor be light and my burden easy and delightful? For who would not lend his voice to the hallelujahs of a nation's jubilee when the chains of servitude had been torn from its limb? But such is not the state of the case. I say with a sad sense of disparity between us, I am not included within the pale of your glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The rich inheritance of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness bequeathed by your forefathers is shared by you, not me. The sunlight that brought life and health to you brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not ours. You may rejoice. We must mourn. 
and to drag a man in fetters in the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems is inhuman mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you intend to mock me, fellow citizens, by calling me here to speak to you today by the rivers of Babylon? Yea, we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps on the willows in the midst thereof. For they who led us away captive required of us a song, and they who wasted us required of us mirth saying sing that song of Zion but how should we sing the Lord's song in a strange land oh Jerusalem if I forget thee may my right hand forget her cunning and if I do not remember thee may my tongue cleave to the root of my mouth fellow citizens beyond your national and tumultuous joy I hear the mournful wailing of millions whose chains, grievous yesterday or today rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them, if I do forget, if I do not remember the bleeding children of sorrow. May my right hand forget her cunning, and may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. To forget them, and to pass lightly over their wrongs, and chime in with the popular theme is treason, most scandalous and shocking, and would make me a reproach before God and the world. My subject then, fellow citizens, is American slavery. The simple story is that 76 years ago, the people of this country were British subjects. Your fathers deemed the English government as the home government and England as the fatherland. The home government did impose upon its colonial children such burdens and restraints as it deemed wise, right, and proper. But your fathers who had not chimed in with the popular idea of the day of the infallibility of government began to differ with those burdens and restraints. They went so far in their excitement as to pronounce the English government as unruly, unjust, and oppressive, and altogether such as not ought to be quietly submitted to. And I scarcely need say, fellow citizens, that my opinion of those measures fully accords with that of your fathers to say now that America was right and England wrong is exceedingly easy. For there was a time when to pronounce against England and in cause of the colonies tried men's souls. Those who did so were called makers of mischief, agitators, rebels, dangerous men. But your fathers were brave men, statesmen, patriots and heroes, and for the good they did and the cause they stood for, I will stand with you to honor them in their memory. Feeling themselves unjustly treated, they earnestly sought redress. They petitioned and they remonstrated. They did so in a decorous, loyal, and respectful manner. But oppression makes a wise man mad. Your fathers were wise men, and if they did not grow mad, they grew restive under this treatment. They felt themselves the victims of grievous wrongs, wholly incurable in their colonial capacity. It was just at this time that the idea of total separation of the colonies from the crown was born, resolved, that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between the colonies and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be dissolved. Friends, your fathers made good that resolution. They love their country better than they love their own private interests. They stake their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor all in the cause of liberty. They seized upon eternal principles and set a glorious example in their defense. Mark them, their solid manhood stands out all the more as we contrast it with these degenerate times. Shall we take a look at this day? with its popular characteristics, 
from the slave's point of view? What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, it is a day that reveals to him more than any other day of the year the gross conduct and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. You know what is a swine drover? I'll show you a man drover. They inhabit all of our southern states. They perambulate the country and crowd the highways of the nation in droves of human stock, armed with pistol, whip, and bowie knife, driving a hundred men, women, and children. These wretched souls are to be sold singly or in lots to suit purchasers. They are food for the cotton field and the deadly sugar mill. March the sad procession as they move along, and the savage wretch who drives them see the old men with locks thin and gray. See the young woman whose shoulders are bare to the scorching sun. Her briny tears falls on the brow of the babe in her arms. See, too, the young girl of 13 weeping as she thinks of her mother from whom she's been torn. Mark the sad procession. Heat and sorrow nearly consumes their strength. Suddenly you hear a quick snap, like the discharge of a rifle. The fetters clank, the chains rattle. Your ears are saluted with a scream that seems to have torn its way into the center of your soul. The crack you heard was the sound of a whip. The scream you heard was the mother with the babe in her arms. Her strength had faltered under the weight of the chains, and the child and the gash in her shoulder tells her to move on. Follow the procession to New Orleans. Attend an auction there. See men examined like horses. See the frames of women rudely and brutally exposed to the shocking gaze of American slave buyers. Tell me, citizens, where under the sun can you witness such a spectacle more fiendish and shocking? Yet this is but a glimpse of the American slave system as it exists in the ruling part of the United States. But it is just in this moment when I hear someone in my audience say, it is just at this time that you and your fellow abolitionists failed to make a favorable impression upon the public mind. If you would argue more and denounce less, if you would persuade more and rebuke less, your cause might be much more likely to succeed. But I submit where all is plain, there's nothing to be argued. What point in the anti-slavery creed would you have me argue? Am I to argue the point that the slave is a man? The point is conceded already. Nobody doubts it. Slaveholders themselves acknowledge it in the enactment of the laws of their government. They acknowledge it when they punish a slave for disobedience. There are 72 crimes in the state of Virginia which, if committed by a black man, may subject him to the punishment of death, while only two of those same crimes, if committed by a white man, may subject him to like punishment. What is this but the acknowledgement that the slave is a moral, intellectual, and responsible being? Southern statute books are filled with enactments teaching the slave under severe fines and penalties how to read and to write. When you can point to any such laws as it relates to the beast of the field, then I will consent to argue the manhood of the slave. Americans! Your Republican politics as well as your Republican religion is fragrantly inconsistent. You boast of your love for liberty, your high civilization, your pure Christianity, while all the while the whole political power of the nation conspires to hold in bondage three million of its countrymen. 
You celebrate fugitives from abroad. You honor them with banquets. You toast them. You salute them. You bless them. But of your own fugitives at home, you advertise. You hunt, arrest, shoot, and kill. You mourn fallen hungry. You make her wrongs the subject of your poets, your orators, and your statesmen. But of the 10,000 wrongs committed against the American slave, you enforce the strictest silence and would deem him an enemy of the nation that would make their subject public discourse. You say that all men are created of one blood and that all men everywhere should love one another, yet you notoriously hate those whose skin is not colored like your own. You proclaim before the world and before the world proclaim, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and have been endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights and that of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yet, you hold in bondage a seventh part of the inhabitants of your country. Friends, the existence of slavery in this country brands your republicanism a sham. Your humanity a base pretense. Your Christianity a lie. It destroys your moral power abroad. It corrupts your politicians at home. It saps the very foundation of religion. It makes your name a hissing and a byword to a mocking earth. Thank you. 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 Did you want to sit in there? So, that's me. He's great to talk to me. All right, well, thank you, Darius. That was riveting. Oh, thank you. As Appreciate always. Thank so, you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. My name is Nate Johnson. I'm the supervisory park ranger at the Frederick Douglass National Historic Site which is right here in Washington, D.C. We're just about three and a half miles from the site, so you have an opportunity to get over there uh, if you would like. Um, and I just got to say, this is a really cool opportunity because I can't believe that we're saying right here in the National Archives, we are mere feet away from where the Declaration of Independence is today, and we are just a few miles from Frederick Douglass' house. We have so much right here at our fingertips, and you really brought that to life. Oh, thank um, you. I thought it was amazing. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, ask some questions of you gentlemen. And uh, first of all, I think, Bob, I want to thank you for your introduction too. And I believe you had some things you wanted to say about how this, was, how this speech was given back when Frederick Douglass did it in 1852. Yeah, actually, I actually wanted to comment on the way it was given right now, that I thought this was the finest performance that I've ever heard of a Douglass speech. And that I want to kind of step <laughs> I want to step back to the 1850s because things were different then. Uh, you were pretty quiet and dutiful and polite and all that, but there were a few moments, maybe one moment that stood out where people laughed. And I've read a whole bunch of transcripts of Douglass's speeches in newspapers, and you'll have a few sentences, and then you'll have parentheses, laughter, <laughs> or a few sentences and parentheses, tell him Frederick, you know, stuff like that. So i um, Back in the 1850s, when Douglas gave speeches, people were really kind of worked up. Uh, he was known not just as a passionate person speaking out against slavery, but as one of the great comic performers. And he did some mimicry early on that I thought was really terrific. 
Uh, the other thing I, I just wanted to say, and not to embarrass you at all, uh, when Douglas gave his speeches, and this really annoyed the abolitionists who sponsored him, women lined up to meet him. Uh, <laughs> and there's stuff in print in which the abolitionists say, particularly they, they want the white women to stay away from Douglas, <laughs> and they didn't. And I was thinking you had a certain charisma that was Douglas-like, and I'll leave it at that. Be careful, my <laughs> wife's in the audience. She, she brought a shotgun yesterday. Okay. And when my wife buys things, she tends to like to use it real quick. <laughs> and, and in this particular speech, when Douglas gave it in 1852, and we might disagree a little because we have talked about this, um, people in Rochester loved it. I mean, that's, that's my understanding. And there's a chapter or section in, in William McFeely's biography about this particular occasion, which he says, quoting from newspapers, that people at the end of the speech, just there was wild applause. Uh, someone said, uh, you know, let's endorse this speech as an audience. And there was unanimous approval for that. And then someone said, could we have a copy of the speech? And, uh, Douglas sold 700 copies of speech on the spot uh, by subscription. So I want to say that because the speech, the things that, that you, were, you were performing and stating, speech is quite radical. And um, around, as I, as I said in the introduction, around 1850, uh, abolitionists got a bit more radical following the passage of the Compromise of 1850. And Douglas himself, uh, was participating in uh, rallies against the Fugitive Slave Law. And in the early 1850s, about a year before he gave the speech, he's, he's saying that you would be doing God's work if you were to kill a fugitive slave hunter. And in his 1855 biography, autobi autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom, he says something to the effect of uh, any slave who kills his master is doing nothing very different from what the American revolutionaries did to their British oppressors. And so Douglas really makes a major shift around 1850 in terms of his willingness to adv advocate violence, but it was, it was measured. I mean, and it was rhetorical. He's not out killing people. Uh, but a lot of things that are in this speech that sound kind of shocking to us, you know, that Douglas was saying this, we know of Douglas as this kind of iconic figure connected to William Lloyd Garrison, who was a moral suasionist, was kind of where abolition was going post-compromise of 1850. I'll stop there. I think I'd, since we talked about your performance too, Darius, I think that would be good to, and I ask, what, what is your process for how did you, first of all, it's a really long speech, and uh, you, you memorized portions of it. Um, what is your process for doing that, and then how on you choose to present? Because I really do, I think, in my readings of his mimicry, his use of that, it seemed like that was probably right about where he did it. So what is yeah. your whole process for researching and then presenting? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I, well, a couple of things. One, I know that when Frederick Douglass presented uh, early on, he presented like an actor, almost like it was a one-person show. He would become the characters that he, he would talk about, because he was a master mimicker. He can impersonate. Um, and so I understood that. And there is another performance that I do where I do become different characters in his life uh, that I did perform um, off, off Broadway. But basically, I, I approach it the way that an actor approaches it. We don't really know. Well, we know through writing how Frederick Douglass uh, potentially so sounded. but. We don't have any recording of it. So I always like to go for trying to find the, the man, the human being, the person behind the image uh, where the heart lives and where the soul lives and where the passion lives is one of the things that I think about the most. And then it isn't easy uh, memorizing Frederick Douglass's words because we, you know, we don't talk like that anymore. We don't even write like that anymore. <laughs> Um, and so I, it, it, it took a while to get comfortable with his words, but trying to get at the heart at it, at it uh, thinking about him as a human being has helped out a lot. And then as far as memorization, you know, my technique is just repetition. <laughs> it's over and over and over and over again, so. Yeah. I, think it's a, I think watching the recitals is so important because we can read Frederick Douglass's words of course, he was never videotaped. We don't have any audio of him. But to actually watch you bring that speech to life um, is something so important to do. Um, when you guys 
well, listen to the speech when you've done your own research. What do you think, what do you think is the main message of Frederick Douglass' speech? What do you think he's trying to get across um, here? Uh, in, in general, just the speech in particular. The, the 4th of July speech that Frederick Douglass delivers. What is, what is he, kind of since he talked about the difference in language mm -hmm. and how we don't speak like he does today, what is, in modern terms, what is he trying to say um, to his I, audience? I think he's, he's really, um, it, he's, doing a, he's doing several things, I believe, in the speech. One is he's really painting the, the, the graphic picture of hypocrisy. How can you stand for liberty and independence and freedom and yet hold human beings in bondage? And then to understand where we as slaves should be, think about where your founding fathers were. It's the same situation. And so I believe that Frederick Douglass took the opportunity and advantage of the opportunity to promote the liberation of the slaves based on uh, that everything that the Founding Fathers was standing for as it relates to freedom and independence. So I don't think he was, I think there was no uh, bitterness or maliciousness in his speaking. I think he was very compassionate and had a, a, a tremendous amount of heart for the people he was speaking to, but he wanted them to see in a, um, a graphic manner uh, the need for these human beings to be free. And so I, his, I believe his goal was to use it as another opportunity to promote f the freedom of the slaves. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, I basically agree with that. Um, I think he's basically saying that the American Revolution is unfinished. Uh, it's incomplete as long as there is slavery. And that was a very profound message in the 1850s. Uh, a pass I mean, um, there is uh, excerpted from a two-hour speech, um, according to people who were there. It took about two hours, and I could imagine enjoying hearing you talk for <laughs> two hours. Uh, the speech ends with Frederick Douglass. It's a very powerful uh, moment that you, know, you could add in other variants or perhaps had. It's all about hope. I mean, he uses the word hope. Despite everything I'm saying, I have hope. So I think part of the power of the speech, and here I'm, I might sound like, you know, I'm a, doing a July 4th kind of number, but part of the power of the speech is that he is tapping into American ideology and saying this has a lot of potential, uh, ideology about equality, for one. So it, it's a highly critical speech. He's angry because of the fugitive slave law. Uh, he's invoking the American Revolution, and he's saying the ideology here might not be so bad. It might actually be precisely the ideology we need to bring about the freedom of the slaves, which is kind of looks forward to where Abraham Lincoln was coming from near the end of the Civil War. I think it's in the, in the, same, in the speech, too, he also refers to the Constitution quite a bit, and he talks about it as being a freedom-loving document. Um, and that's quite a different view than the Garrisonians, correct? Yeah, so, so Garrison believed, with good reason, that the Constitution was pro-slavery because it had a three-fifths clause built into it, which is to say that slaves count as three-fifths of a person for representation. So from, from Garrison's point of view, the Constitution was supporting the slave power, was pro-slavery, and thus he was arguing against working within the political system. He's kind of working against it or beside it. And that, as, as I said in the introduction, is an important m m kind of point that Douglas breaks from Garrison on. And I think it has to do with what I was talking about, with this idea of hope. So he says, sure, there's a three-fifths clause, but the spirit of the Constitution is anti-slavery because he links the Constitution to the Declaration of Independence. So it's about equality, it's about human equality. Once he makes that assumption, he can get involved with politics. And uh, he starts to vote, and he starts to work for political parties. And yeah, so, so right around this time, actually, is the point where he's saying uh, the Constitution offers some hope. We have this change in ideas about yeah, politics, about the use of violence. Yeah, and, and then he, he has a personal 
kind of dispute with Garrison. So, you know, if you want to be a little bit cynical, you could say, he came to hate Garrison. Garrison believed this about the Constitution. Therefore, I will believe this about the Constitution, which was the opposite of Garrison. <laughs> so I think still today, too, this is a speech that like, intellectually it still makes us think, and emotionally it still makes us feel. And it's still a very powerful speech. Why do you all think it still remains so relevant today to us? It's been 165 years since Frederick Douglass delivered this speech. And still, I mean, you can feel it in the crowd. It's still something that affects us today. Why is that? I think for a couple of reasons. There's, um, there's this speech, and if you don't mind my mentioning, there's another speech um, a year before he died called Lessons of the Hour, Why the Negro is Lynched which if you read that speech, and I, I do perform that speech also, it, it will make you think of today, some of the things that he's saying. And I think there's so many parallels to today and there's so many things in the atmosphere. I will say that if uh, it were maybe 15 or 20 years ago, I don't think we would feel the heat of the speech the way that we do today in 2017 because of some of the events that has taken place in the past three, three or four years. And so I think that throughout the course of time and throughout the decades, because there's still these elements in our country, we relate to this 4th of July speech because it resonates with a lot of the, the, the things that have been happening mm -hmm. um, in the past few decades. Yeah. T today's Washington Post had an article about the kind of renewed popularity of James Baldwin. And I think that Baldwin is popular. People are reading him today for similar reasons, uh, which is odd given that our president loves Frederick Douglass, apparently. <laughs> uh, but they're both, they're both talking about black humanity and blindness to black humanity, both this speech and, and a lot of Baldwin's writings. And I, I think, uh, with What's the Slave is the Fourth of July, which is the title that, that Douglas used for it. Um, you know, as, I've, as I've already said, it's, it's also kind of tapping into American ideology and arguing that there is a powerful reform side to American ideology and that history can change, things can change. Or else he wouldn't have given the speech. Yeah. So, Doris, you'd mentioned lessons of the hour as being another speech that you do. And Bob, I know you've written a lot about Frederick Douglass and his three autobiographical re uh, writings. I mean, what other speeches and writings do you think are important that we do need to look at to understand Frederick Douglass's life? One of the things that, the context of that question is one of the things I think at the site we discuss often is I think we're kind of in danger sometimes when we look at one speech so much of that person, like Martin Luther King, we just think instantly of I have a dream speech. Well, what does that speech mean? Um, does everybody still know the meaning of it? Um, which I think we do, but Martin Luther King's life, for example, he, there's many more speeches he gives. Um, Frederick Douglass gave many, many more speeches. He wrote a lot. So what other speeches and writings do you put right up there along with Fourth of July? I would say that the, the speech that I believe he was the most popular for back there in a time is a speech that had nothing to do with abolition, and that was uh, Self-Made Man. And the idea of the self-made man back during that time is different than today. When we think self-made men today, we think of uh, self-made millionaires. But back during that time, the self-made man was a reformer, someone that would change as their knowledge grew, and then they would use that knowledge to reform. And Frederick Douglass had this great speech called Self-Made Man, and it's all about, and at the end of the day, it's all about overcoming what your given limitations are. As he, as he did in his life. He was born into chattel slavery, but he overcame those, um, those limitations. And that message to me is extremely powerful because it's, it's a universal message. It does two things. One, it shows the um, amazing potential in a human being, uh, regardless of whether he's uh, black or white. But then it also shows the, what a, a, a human being can do with that potential. And even though it was called self-made man back during that time, we should, take, we should also take that out and think about women, that it speaks to women too, which toward the end of his life, he began to fight for women's rights, uh, 
with the same passion as he did against slavery. So it's a speech that teaches us how to overcome or talks about how, how to overcome our given limitations and the potential that we have within us. Doug, Douglas had a, his fatal heart attack about three hours after he gave a speech at a women's rights convention. So, I mean, he, he did do a lot of speaking about women's rights. I, I, I am taken with the speech he gave just a year later, the claims of the Negro ethnologically understood. It's just kind of uh, a fascinating scientific study of race and racism, but mostly of race. Like, uh, what do racial scientists know? Where are they coming from? Why are they saying things about black people as if they're you know, radically different from white people? And the really interesting thing about the speech is that he gave it at Case Western Reserve. He was invited to give the Phi Beta Kappa speech. And I, I need to learn, I want to learn more about that. You know, how is it that these white students came to know Douglas well enough to invite him there to give this speech? Uh, Two other things I would just quickly mention in terms of uh, works that have interested me, and they aren't speeches. In 1853, Douglas published a novella that not many people know called The Heroic Slave, which was uh, his, in some ways a response to Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, and it's a kind of fictionalization of an 1841 slave rebellion uh, on, on the Creole ship. And it's a Douglas that a lot of People don't know, you know, Douglas who writes fiction. And uh, as, as mentioned in, in the introduction to me, I, I'm very interested in Douglas's autobiographies, which would make me different from a 19th century person, because 19th century people basically loved the speeches. And, you know, some people knew the autobiographies, but not many. I, I love his last autobiography, the, the Life and Times of Frederick Douglass, where there are chapters on uh, his involvement with John Brown, chapters with his, on his friendship with Abraham Lincoln. And uh, I, I think that there is a problem in the way that a lot of us understand Douglass in terms of that very famous first autobiography, the narrative of, uh, of, of the slave Frederick Douglass, published in 1845, when he was all of like 28. Um, he lives to 1895, he has this fascinating life, and he has this massive, I think very readable, 650 page autobiography uh, that, that covers so many aspects of his life. And, and so I hope that my own work on, on that autobiography will lead others to, to read it and, and for a greater recovery. Because I think, you know, year by year, he's just so fascinating. And we tend to focus on the pre-Civil War years. I'm glad you mentioned the anti-lynching speech. I touched on that. What are some of the lesser known aspects of Frederick Douglass's life that interest you the most? And <laughs> having researched Frederick Douglass and, um, and portraying <coughs> Frederick Douglass. Will there be time for questions? There will be time for questions. Uh, we will, um, I will let you, uh, the audience members know when to stand up and go towards the microphones. But I'll, I'll give a very quick response. Uh, Douglas was, was uh, an ambassador to Haiti in, I guess it's, it's the late 1880s, and he became friendly with Haitian leaders. And he lost his job because American governmental people thought he was too sympathetic to Haiti. And, Haiti taps him to be the person who runs overseas the Haitian pavilion at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. That's a whole different story about Douglas. Uh, you know, Douglas about the Southern Americas, about Haiti, uh, these very interesting political friendships, and kind of his problems of actually being a politician because he couldn't hold on to the job. Uh, he started a bank. Um, it didn't, it didn't do well, but he did start a bank. Um, he, really, Frederick Douglass was a, a rock star. He was like the Jimi Hendrix of his day. Um, he, back during that, today, everybody wants to be a basketball star, football star, a, you know, rap star. Well, public speaking was that. It was, he was the Sidney Poitier of his day. He was the great actor of his day, as far as his fame. Um, and so a lot of times we don't know that Frederick Douglass had that kind of power. And he was the most photographed man right. of that century, too, is something to know about Frederick Douglass. Absolutely. So at this time, I'm going to let audience members know if you have any questions to um, please, you can begin to line up at the microphones. I'm going to ask one more question here. 
uh, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Um, but I just wanted to mention too, when you're talking about, especially Frederick Douglass's life and times, um, that he wrote that while he was living in the house that is now protected and is part of the Frederick Douglass National Historic Site. So today I actually got to sit on Frederick Douglass's porch and read <laughs> portions from his life and times and think, oh man, he was just sitting right inside this house uh, writing that book. And uh, he was actually, while he was serving as ambassador to Haiti, he was living in that house. Um, so it's a, it's a really interesting place to visit, and I just wanted to let everyone know too that during the uh, following year, 2018 here, is the bicentennial of Frederick Douglass's birth. And so there are going to be a lot of programs at the site and probably internationally, nationwide, to recognize Frederick Douglass's life and legacy. And so that's what my last question is going to get at, is that why do you think it's important that we recognize the life and legacy of Frederick Douglass today? I believe that it's important uh, for one of the reasons why I mentioned earlier is he represents freedom and liberty universally. He represents it for me as an African-American man and my wife as an African-American woman. But he also represents freedom as it relates to all the different aspects that we go through in our life, being able to overcome our limitations. Some of us are um, experiencing certain bondage as it may relate to addiction. It may relate to a relationship. It may relate to a job. It may relate to uh, a certain aspect of how you're living in life. And what I've noticed is when I perform Frederick Douglass, my audiences are normally like this, is very diverse. And I believe it's like that because the message of liberty and the message of freedom speaks to our spirit, speaks to our heart. And so I believe that is the reason why we should continue to remember Frederick Douglass's legacy and also to remember that, you know, one of the things that he said after one of his speeches is, this discussion is not over. The discussion of slavery is not over. The discussion of racism is not over. The discussion of discrimination is not over. And so because it is not over, we should continue to remember. And I would agree with everything <laughs> that, that you said, so I don't want to repeat that. I'll just say that I'm a literary historian, so in addition to everything you said, I, I value the fact that he's a great writer and I work in the 19th century, and I think of him as someone who really opens up so many aspects of the 19th century. And I'm one of these 19th century people who think that if you know the 19th century, you know the 20th and the 21st century. So, you know, for all these reasons, I think he's, he's such a compelling figure. I also like to read him in relation to other writers. So I think uh, I don't want to simply celebrate Douglas all by himself. Actually, I have a book. Uh, edited book on Douglas and, and Herman Melville. And they were in conversation in, in very interesting ways. So I'll stop there. Great. Well, Bob and Drew, thank you so much. We're going to now take some questions from the visitors. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> was this mic on? Sorry. Thank yes, you. Yes. My name is John Del Pino. I have a comment first and a question about Frederick Douglas. And thank you very much for those organizing this and especially you, sir, for recreating the passions of Frederick Douglass. Thank you. As a young man born in Columbia who was raised in Washington, D.C. area, I would just say I was not someone who was designed to be a basketball star or a rabbit, although I admire those, but someone who deeply admired history, especially U.S. history, and having studied U.S. history and public policy in Chicago, but that is neither relevant, actually. My question is related to the relationship between Lincoln and Douglass. Since those who know Douglass know especially that Douglass was the first black man invited to the White House, I like all your thoughts, especially how with Lincoln's tragic end, but also um, his inspiring message and my belief that the best speech ever by American president the second inaugural. What are your thoughts, all of you there, on how Douglas himself evolved on the very topic today, the 4th of July, given what he later experienced in life in terms of hope, experience, but also the lessons and passions that he himself had? Thank you. Do you want me to answer that? I think, Bob, maybe, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I have a kind of revisionary chapter on the Douglas-Lincoln relationship in my, in my new book. So uh, I think the, the story that's been told is kind of uh, in here, implicit in your question, that uh, Lincoln very much admired Douglas, Douglas very much admired Lincoln. Uh, they had profound interactions during 
the Civil War, those interactions had an impact on both people. And uh, Douglass in particular was arguing very vociferously for the right for black men to fight in the Civil War as part of the uh, Northern Army. Uh, so, and then, I mean, Douglas loves Lincoln. I, I'll say all that. And then the revisionary part of my reading from an, kind of picking up on Douglas's autobiographical writings and on his speeches is I think that this relationship, relationship has been overly mythified. Uh, they met several times. My estimate is they met for a total of one hour over four years of the Civil War. Uh, Douglas has speeches about Lincoln that are highly critical. Uh, Douglas never voted for Lincoln, uh, which is really interesting. Even in 1864, he doesn't vote for, for Lincoln. He thinks that Lincoln is committed too much to the Union and doesn't care as much about the slaves. And there's fascinating material in Douglas's journals, in Douglas's magazine called Douglas's Monthly, in which month by month he's just going after Lincoln. Uh, and he's concerned that Lincoln wants to colonize blacks to Central America. So uh, the revisionist part of my reading is that this was a more prickly relationship than has been previously been thought. That doesn't mean that by 1865 that these people haven't profoundly influenced each other. So I think that that's also there. I, I think that it's one of the more fascinating stories about the Civil War, this particular relationship. Uh, Lincoln was keeping an eye on Douglas in the early 1860s and reading what he was saying. There's evidence of that. Uh, and Douglas was following the Lincoln-Douglas, Stephen Douglas debates in, in 1858. Uh, so to make a long argument short, what I argue in my book is that there's a more profound human connection between Frederick Douglass and John Brown than there is between Frederick Douglass and Lincoln, at least to the time of the second inauguration. But I still see profound influences on both sides. And when Lincoln is, is assassinated, Douglass gives these, speaking of great speeches, I mean, he gives some great speeches about Lincoln and about his love of Lincoln and about Lincoln as the great savior of the country. So I think it's, it's a kind of complex, prickly, and ultimately still very moving relationship between these two great figures. Do we have another question? Yeah, I have two questions, and it may be anyone on the panel can answer. Uh, one is about the relationship between Douglas and Harriet Tubman, because they were both from the Eastern Shore, although they were from different counties. I'm not sure about the dates on that. And the second one is, um, and I've thought more about this over the years as I've studied uh, African American history, my history. When Douglas was making his speeches about slavery, what were the thoughts of Native Americans? What, what did Douglas think about the status of Native Americans? Because slaves weren't citizens, free blacks weren't citizens, and, and Indians weren't, Native Americans were not in, uh, citizens. So we had three categories where there were no citizenship. Uh, so I'll go back to Harriet Tubman, since Harriet Tubman is real big right now in Dorchester County. So did they meet? Did they have similar thoughts? Uh, any, any thoughts on that? I can answer just a, a little bit about that. Um, I don't know too much about his relationship with Harriet Tubman, how close it was, but we definitely know that they knew each other, they spent time together. And particularly when Frederick Douglass lived up in Rochester, New York, he's fairly close to the Canadian border. And where is Harriet Tubman trying to take the people that she's helping to escape but across that border? And she spends time in Canada herself. So she's going through Rochester, staying at the Douglas home then. Um, and I know I've seen in our collection, we have a collection of thousands of objects that belong to Frederick Douglass. Among them is at least one biography on Harriet Tubman um, from her time. Uh, so we know Frederick Douglass connect, collected other people's narratives, and that included Harriet Tubman's. Um, 
I don't know, Bob. Do you know I, more I about their relationship? I remember him commenting on Harry Tubman in his autobiographies, which is why maybe I haven't further explored that relationship. Uh, Douglas was always someone who argued for citizenship for people who were disenfranchised. And I think very powerfully, not to deflect too far away from your, your question, uh, but in the 1870s to 1890s, up to the time of his death, he was arguing for citizen, citizenship rights for Asian Americans, for so-called coolies. And that put him in the real minority you know, of, of voices during that time. So I know less about uh, his interest or championing of Native Americans, more about other um, immigrants who he was championing for citizenship and was arguing for citizenship and voting rights for women, uh, though he accepted uh, the constitutional amendments that initially gave black men and not uh, white women the right to vote. And that led to extraordinary friction for a couple of years between Douglas and women's rights advocates. Um, yeah, and not just um with the uh, Native Americans, but we know for sure the Mexicans, as well as Asians, women. And then he became very famous in Ireland because of the uh, oppression some of the Irish were having there. They looked to Frederick Douglass's writings for inspiration and hope. And when he was overseas there, he was very famous um, for speaking to what was happening with them. Um, but he did his speeches and his ideas did inspire and connect with people outside of uh, African Americans. And then he did have a, a relationship with Harriet Tubman, and there were letters um, or some, some kind of correspondence between the two of them, and I believe she sent him a gift of one of her walking sticks. And he also had a, probably even more of an intimate friendship with Sojourner Truth. Good question. Yes, sir. I was wondering, um, Ma Massachusetts uh, made slavery, uh, outlawed slavery almost immediately after uh, independence, and several of the other states were felt it was incompatible with what the Declaration of Independence. Also seemed like Washington and Jefferson were aware that slavery, was, uh, supporting slavery would be hypocritical, but it looked like they're more than just simple hypocrisy. They, their uh, greed, so to speak, that what they lifestyle they wanted to maintain overrode what they were aware of. Uh, how, uh, by the time Douglas was speaking, how much had the? Does it seem like uh, the South had convinced itself totally that uh, uh, they were justified? Uh, or were they still aware to some degree that, the, that there was a hypocrisy there? Mm -hmm. I think uh, generally, so in the context and the circumstances change by the time that Douglas gives his speech. And, and I certainly do think some of the founding fathers maybe did see that maybe the, that if slavery did not extend, it would die. Um, but they could not foresee the cotton gin. They uh, could not foresee before the abolition of the international slave trade, that slave traders would bring a lot more enslaved people into the country. They couldn't foresee all that. That really um, strengthened the nation and the South in particular's commitment to slavery. Um, they could not foresee that, but we do know then by Douglass's generation, generally what the Founding Fathers had called slavery was a necessary evil. By the time of Douglass, they're referring to it as a positive good, something that is good socially, economically, and politically for the country. Yeah. So I'd say by, by, by the 1830s, slavery was not going to go away in the South. I, I recently held a visiting fellowship at a Southern university where they're all saying, oh, you know, why, why'd they fight the Civil War? You know, slavery was going to just end naturally. I, I just don't see that. Uh, slavery didn't just end in the Northeast in any kind of natural way, too. There's no specific kind of moment in Massachusetts where they said slavery is over. It was like a series of court cases through the late 18th century. Slavery was legal in New York 
state until 1827, which is kind of remarkable. Uh, New Jersey had slaves up to the 1840s. So when Douglass is concerned about the national, nationalizing of slavery through the Fugitive Slave Law, you could also look to the north. And even in places where there wasn't slavery, like uh, Philadelphia, uh, there's extraordinary segregation and racial strife uh, to the point where uh, you know, pro-slavery pro people could say to black people, you know, run away to Philadelphia at your peril. Uh, you're not going to meet a very nice fate. Uh, but with Jefferson in the 1780s and notes of the state of Virginia, he imagines the end of slavery. Uh, by the 1810s, 1820s, that's over. Uh, interestingly, Washington frees his slaves on his death. So that's, you know, this great symbolic action but it didn't do much in, in Virginia beyond being that kind of symbolic action. The issue, too, was that it, 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 was, it was really about the money. You know, it was about the money that, that slavery, I mean, you had, I mean, just think about it. If I'm a slave owner and each of you are on my plantation and everything that you're doing is free labor, imagine what that, that does for me and imagine what it can do for <laughs> Uh, an economy. So even with, even with Lincoln, you know, Lincoln's argument to Frederick was, you know, we can look toward ending slavery, but it'll take at least a hundred years. So Lincoln's idea of ending it was, we'll end it, but it's going to have to be set up to end a hundred years later, because nobody could connect to the idea of it just abruptly ending. Um, and so a lot of times we forget about the economic part of the reason why slavery existed, as slavery still exists today with children, with women, with one of the things I think Frederick Douglass would have stood up for in this day, the injustice in the criminal system, criminal justice system, the uh, injustice in the prison system. Frederick Douglass would have been just as controversial today as he was yesterday as it relates to some of the things that we're experiencing right now. Um, there's, there's slave labor that's going on right under our nose right now. And the reason why it's here is because of the money that it brings in. And so that's, that's the reason why um, I, I believe that it was hard for them to let go of during that time because it's hard for us to let go of it today. And just as we don't know much about it and we kind of look the other way, it's how the public was looking away and didn't know much about it back during that time. And it took people like Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, John Brown, and many others to bring it to public attention of what was actually going on. And then you go to other countries and there's chattel slavery in other countries. So. So that concludes the program. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Darius, and thank you, Bob. Thank you. Appreciate I appreciate it. it. Thank you.